Hello and welcome. We're live from Studio 400 here at Five Towns College. I'm Sean Lanigan, and it is an honor to be interviewing our guest today, Cecilia Dowd, who is currently a reporter for Newsday. Cecilia, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So take us through a typical day at Newsday, like when you get your story assignments, when you go out into the field, things like that. Well, a typical day usually starts the night before, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because I'll usually send in, excuse me, a pitch list. So the press releases for the next day or the police releases will start coming in the night before overnight. I usually get up pretty early and you know just comb through my emails and we also obviously read other news outlets to see what they're covering, anything from PAX to Channel 7 to Channel 12 to you know the local Riverhead paper, it could be anything. Um, I really never know what I'm doing until typically 9.30 in the morning after the morning meeting unless we know ahead of time there's like a big sentencing. Like for example, the former NASA County Executive Ed Mangano was just sentenced. We knew that was coming. I knew I was going to be on that. But otherwise, you know, it kind of depends on what happens overnight. I do cover a lot of breaking news uh, as opposed to features. So um, I'll send in my list. Um, they'll discuss the big stories at the meeting and then I'll usually get the call around 9.30, 9.40 a.m. Is that the industry standard to look at what other networks are covering and then uh, like try to follow suit? Is that I mean, like if anyone standard? tells you no, they're lying. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well. we, obviously the goal and, you know, Newsday is really good at getting only in Newsdays. Like we, we love to dig and have our exclusives, but of course we watch other uh, media because, um, you know, a local paper may find a really uh, great story. Um, I mean, we obviously take pride when people fo follow our stories, sure, but absolutely. but I think it's a I think any journalist would tell you we follow all other local outlets. I mean, to not do that would be silly. You brought up Newsday being a local paper. Um, what are the benefits and advantages of being a local reporter instead of being a national reporter? Do you think? Um, never been a national reporter, but I mean, the cool thing about being a local reporter is I've been in journalism out here for 17 years. Um, and you really get to build those local connections. I imagine if you're a national reporter, I mean, I have a friend who's a national reporter um, for the Associated Press, mm. and he has like all these great sources in like you know the DOJ and things like that. So I guess it could be the same, but arguably you could be a national correspondent for let's say one of the major networks, and they're like, okay, you're going to Washington State today to do this breaking story, you're going to Baltimore, Maryland to do this uh, big fire, I don't know. And it's got, I, I would imagine it has to be hard to really build sources when you literally could be anywhere in the country on any given day. So the beauty here is that, I mean, I, I live here, I grew up here, and you know, you really, you gain people's trust, right, by getting to know, know them over the years. So it's definitely much easier to build a community with local news than the national news. I mean, I, I, I've never been national, I don't know, but I would imagine. Mm, right. I mean, the longer you, I think you are in one place, just common sense, right? It's just Absolutely. the longer you are in one place, the easier it is to build a network of sources. So as a journalist and as a reporter, what makes a good story a great story? Um, well, I can tell you that people love, um, on Long Island, people love stories about, well, lately our crime numbers have done really well. Like people want to see if there's, something breaking in their neighborhood, they're gonna to go to our website and they're gonna click on it, right? Like let's say, I mean this is a terrible example, but years ago there were four young men killed in a central Iceland park, right? Um, and they were at the hands of MS-13. So that's like a big story. Anyone around that area wants to click on that. But I will tell you, people love stories about pets. Okay. Um, our Newsday subscribers love stories <laughs> about like when a new supermarket's coming to town, those oh, okay. do very well. Um, but I think it's common sense, right? Like I think to myself, if I weren't a reporter and I'm sitting at home, would I click on this? You know, like the hawk story we'll talk about. Mm. A hawk is swooping down and attacking people in Northport. <laughs> I'd click on that, you know, so. Well, why don't we click it and play it right sure. now? That'll be, that'll be the first piece we look at okay. of the hawk uh, attacking residents in Northport. All right. Let's take a look. It just knocked my hat off and it flew off to the other side of the street with another hawk. So there's like four of them now. Siobhan Gerald said she was on her daily walk listening to a murder podcast when a bird came flying over my head and I saw it was a hawk and it flew up in the tree. So I was taking a picture of it and then when I turned around, I felt something smack me on the back of my head. She says it felt like a shovel thumping her. You can imagine listening to a murder podcast. I thought I was getting abducted. So I, <laughs> I hit the floor. Were you hurt? I, I just had like a headache and a bump. 
She's not the only victim of the red-tailed hawk. Police say there have been at least 11 attacks in Northport and likely more that haven't been reported. They've been happening since last summer. About seven people have required medical attention uh, due to like lacerations on their head or on their ears, scratches, that type of thing. The attacks happened in this area here near the intersection of Main Street and Church Street. Unfortunately, it, it does seem to attack women more than, than men, um, generally women that have gray hair. So we don't know if it's uh, mistaking these people for a squirrel or another type of animal. Last year, a juvenile hawk was caught and relocated, but then the attacks continued. They started to think maybe they didn't trap the, the, the exact bird that um, was doing the attacks. So. Officials think the hawk, unclear if it's male or female, may be sitting on eggs waiting for them to hatch. Crossing guard Francine Klingman, stationed right underneath where the hawks fly, has a bird's eye view. She says a runner was another victim. And it went down, banged her, up, down, banged, yeah, all over again. One. one time that we were watching, we saw the hawk swoop down on a family of uh, kids and mom riding their bicycles. The village police chief says the DEC has located a nest. Our ultimate goal is to, to get that bird uh, captured and, and relocated to, to keep these attacks from happening. Cecilia Dowd for Newsday TV. You know, it's fascinating. We, we had a student in MassCom recently for an off-campus reporter package uh, do the same story. And what I noticed with yours was you had a lot of great interviews. You had a person that was attacked by a hawk. You had the crossing guard. How do you get those type of interviews to get people to open up to you about those kinds of stories? Well, that, this was a huge struggle, so I was sent there, and I didn't, know, I didn't have a name of any of the victims. We knew the area where the hawks were, but mm -hmm. we didn't know who had been attacked, and I just, it, persistence paid off on this one. I just went up to person after person in Northport. Have you heard about these hawks? And I don't even know how many people I tried, and I just happened upon that woman who was a victim. I mean, mm -hmm. it was sheer persistence and oh, luck. Wow. Yes, I didn't, didn't know her. Um, the police chief uh, took a, little, a couple phone calls and trying to see if he'd talk, and um, the crossing guard was very just willing to talk. I wasn't sure if she would be, because um, you know sometimes you'll have people who are on the clock and they'll be worried if they'll get in trouble. But um, right, right. but no, it was just sheer luck and and it was persistence that we got the victim. So it's interesting because students like myself and other students, when we do reporter packages, sometimes we get like thirty to forty no's. Like I've yep. tried to do stories where it's like it, it seems like hundreds of no's, and you're like, you know, I got to get somebody to talk. So. What advice do you have to students, you know, despite getting all those no's to maybe get people to agree to be on camera and discuss stories? Well, it's a couple of things. I mean, it's also a hard time right now. Obviously, there's a lot of anti-media sentiment over the mm -hmm. last few years, and it's been yeah. difficult. But I've seen other reporters sometimes, and they just want to get the job done, and they, like, stick the microphone in the face, and that yeah. really turns people off. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what I do is if I'm doing a door knock and just trying to get a resident, mm -hmm. I'll tell... Um, the photographer I'm working with, hey, just stand back, you know, don't put the camera in their face. Let me just go up, chat with them first. And that works a lot of the time, you know. Or sometimes if somebody's really sorry, sort of hesitant, I'll be like, look, this is why we're doing this story. This is why it's important. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. But I think if you try to make a human connection, whereas some people just kind of go up and they're very aggressive, you know, that doesn't work. You brought up anti-media sentiment just now. And... Uh, I think this is a good time to go into the professional organizations that you're a part of and if they try to, you know, get rid of that anti-media sentiment, some of the organizations here. SPJ? Like the, the SPJ. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that's part of why I'm here today. So I'm a board member of the Press Club of Long Island and the, um, the umbrella organization is SPJ or Society of Professional Journalists. And it's the largest journalism organization, I believe, in the world. And you have to pay a fee for students. It's discounted. It's thirty-seven fifty for a year. Mm -hmm. And then once you, because I'm encouraging you guys to join, it's actually it's really really cool. Um, and once you join SPJ, you go on the website and you click on Press Club of Long Island. There are no separate dues to be a member of the Press Club of Long Island. And there are so many great resources. You get a free uh, magazine. It's called Quill, and they'll talk about everything going on with the press. Going back to your question about anti-media sentiment, this and that. Mm -hmm. It's a great networking organization. And I was just, before I came here, I was talking to my fellow board member, a longtime reporter at Newsday. And he told me that when he helps students get jobs once they graduate, he says if he sees on their resume that they're a member of SPJ, that really, really helps. Because it oh, shows wow. that you care yeah. and you're involved. Um, 
I also think it looks good on my resume that I'm a board member of the Press Club of Long Island. I mean, that's not why I do it. It's all, vo it's all volunteer. I mean, we do this on our own time. You know, we have monthly 7 a.m. meetings. But as a member, you don't go to that. That's just the board. But, um, and there's super cool tools on our web a website. Like, there's, uh, exam there's resumes. Um, so if you're looking like to get out in the professional world, you could look at the examples we have there. We host monthly panels. Like I hosted a really cool one on covering the courts, and I had these like top attorneys from Long Island, and I had Eileen La Palmer from News 12. Now she's with 1010 Wins, and we discussed. You know, we had both sides, right? We had the lawyers who we try to interview, and then we had the reporter who's trying to interview them and understand mm -hmm. how the courts work. So we do a lot of really, really cool stuff. Um, and for students, it's it's a it's really not too expensive. Um, I mean, I know it's tough being a student and having to, to pay for things as is, let alone join, but it's really worth it. And um, we're trying to increase membership on Long Island. Um, but yeah, when Bill was telling me this morning, he goes, you know, when I see it on someone's resume that they're a member, that shows like how into the profession they are mm. and how much they care. And there are so many cool tools on our, our website and we offer many resources and we're always willing to help mentor students. And, um, and then SPJ, um, you, you guys should check out their website. Uh, I think they're, well, maybe they'll put it up later, but it's, it's really cool. It's really cool for aspiring journalists and current journalists. And are these meetings in person on Zoom or on Zoom once a month? Well, no, our, the, the meetings I was telling you about it being voluntary, that's just the board. That's oh, private. The board, but, okay. but the, yeah. the uh, panels that we do, they used to be in person, but I don't know when. They've been on Zoom for two years now. So I did the, right. but it's actually worked in our favor because I think a lot of the times people are so busy, especially doing what we do, and it's hard to get somewhere. And we've noticed our numbers have really uh, ticked up because it's on Zoom. So people, you know, don't have to worry about like running from a story to there. They can just log onto their computer or their phone wherever they are. So our panels for the last two years have been on Zoom. I also did one on news writing because I used to write for a newsletter. So that was pretty successful. They're really interesting panels. Really, really cool. We do a lot of good stuff. So. You just brought up news writing. You know, with, with the technology the way it is now and the way it's been for several years, is there still a benefit to print media in your mind? You mean getting an actual newspaper? Yeah, like newspaper a physical or? newspaper or a newsletter. Like Some people newsport, love the actual newsletter. newspaper. I mean, okay. my dad would not be able to live without his Newsday and New mm -hmm. York Times, you know. Um, I think there's still a benefit to the print paper, but I mean, I think digital, you know, is just as good. I mean, it's, I think it, it tends to also depend on the age group. Absolutely. Um, I think younger, you know, people like you guys probably prefer digital, um, but, but people do love their paper. I mean, I know a lot of people, and they're not old, you know, and they like to wake up with their coffee and read, you know, Newsday. So, absolutely, there's and a benefit to both. Oh, no question. And speaking of Newsday, we had a webinar here earlier this week, uh, this past Wednesday, where Newsday, uh, the owner, Pat Dolan, spoke. And they, they talked about Newsday TV. You know, yes, which is what I do. And having their own streaming channels. So uh, tell us about that experience so far of being on the Newsday TV channel. Yeah, so we're going to start a newscast, which I'm sure he spoke about. Um, so. It's all digital. It's like the, which I think a lot of us consider the future of news, right? And you can stream mm. us on certain apps, which is cool. Um, but I'm really doing what I used to do. I used to be a reporter at Fios One News, um, which is a TV station, but it shut down. Mm. It's, I'm doing the same thing. Um, I'm doing, you saw the stand up and you see me asking questions with the microphone, but it's just going on the web. We actually had a former student at Fios One, I believe, Ashana Narain, who was five times. I know the name, but I, mm. I've never met her. Yeah, I know her name. Was there. You mentioned you worked at several different places. Was yep. there a moment years ago where you said, you know, I want to be a reporter or I want to work in media? Yeah, I grew up listening to 1010 Wins on the radio. My mom always had it on. My and father did too. Yeah. I grew up watching CBS2 uh, News, mm -hmm. and I just loved watching the news with my mom. And then what happened was I got in, I always wanted to be a reporter, but I didn't know if I could hack it. And I got an internship at News 12 Long Island at the assignment desk. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but... In, a t in TV world, the assignment desk is where you come up with stories, you set them up. So if you're the reporter, I'm working with you, and we're like, oh, you're going to do this Hawk story. So my job would be to start cold calling people, trying to set up interviews, and then I could call you and say, all right, you're going here at 11 AM. I would send up the news chopper whenever there was like a big fire. I was the one to call the hangar and send up the chopper. I would answer the phones. It's like one of the hardest jobs in the newsroom to be an assignment editor, but it was gave me the best Rolodex, so to speak, you know, the best list of contacts and sources. Um, so anyway, I interned at the desk, and then they offered me a job right after college to work at the assignment desk. And I, 
I don't regret, I wish I had maybe like tried to think about being a reporter a little sooner. I was at there for 10 years at the desk and I loved it and it was the best experience, but then I kind of just got that itch, like I really want to try to be in the field. So I did, and then I went to Fios One News for five years, and then they closed, and I was super lucky that Newsday was starting up this Newsday TV, and I got, I was only unemployed, I think, for two and a half weeks. I was really lucky, because it's, it's a, you know, it could be tricky to get a full-time job, so. Seems to be one of the fascinating things with media is that as the technology grows, the jobs grow, and the amount of job titles seem to increase, so. Hmm. Um, does that seem to benefit, like, you know, students and candidates looking for jobs where there's easier ways to get in, or is it more, is it trickier to stand out? Do I don't know that the jobs grow, I hate to say it. I mean, mm, I think okay. that, I mean, yeah, now you have more, I, I, you could be correct in that, you know, you have more, like, digital outlet, right? You have, like, Politico, I guess, and that didn't exist maybe 20 years ago, but mm. but it, it has been a tougher time for, for news, um, and I think there are outlets that are cutting back on things. I'm not right. talking about Newsday, but I mean, or for example, look what happened with CNN Plus. You know, yeah, I don't right. know if you guys follow that, but they just started yeah. this whole streaming service and and then I guess it wasn't working out and after three mm. weeks they dissolved it. So it, it is, it's a tough time for news. It's like, you know, you have all these um, outlets who are trying to figure out how to navigate the future of journalism, right? Are people going to pay for a streaming service or they want to watch the old school TV or what do you want? So it's a difficult, a difficult, uh, so I don't know if there's more job. I think it would depend on which outlet you're talking sure. about. Um, you know, at Newsday, we're lucky because we have a large staff and we are growing, which mm. is great. Like they just um, hired two friends of mine actually, uh, to produce for Newsday TV. So we're lucky. But I don't know that every outlet is that lucky. Right, you know, you see some outlet, yeah. you see some outlets, and I don't quote me on this, but I think New York One will, I think New York One, but I'm not sure if I'm right, but some outlets will actually have reporters go out and shoot stories on their cell phones. Mm. And that means that they don't have to pay a photographer to go out with them. And when I was at Files One News, I shot my own stuff. Mm. I shot my own videos most of the time. I mean, if I went live for the newscast, they would send a photographer. So it's definitely a change, it's, it's a changing landscape. You brought up the cell phone and the changing landscape. Discuss as a journalist um, the rise of citizen journalists where, you know, like regular people can do stories with their cell phone. What, what was your like initial reaction to that as like a trained professional journalist? I mean, I don't see too many of those people. I mean. On any given day, I'll be at a press conference, and it'll mm -hmm. be every, it'll be like a, you know, Newsday might have two of us, because they'll have a print reporter, and then they'll have me, the TV reporter. You have the Herald, you have News 12. I don't see citizen journalists that often. Mm -hmm. When I do see them, I, it'll tend to be like at a Black Lives um, Matter rally, or mm -hmm. George Floyd protest. Like, that summer, um, there were people who had blogs who I would see coming out with their phones. Um, but I don't see that actually in person that often, so. We learned in a couple of different classes that um, if citizen journalists on social media, if they have a video, if they have something, sometimes news organizations will ask them for like permission, like can we use this yes, video? Yes, that's true. So, or it could just be your average Joe who doesn't consider themselves a, a citizen journalist. Right. Mm -hmm. But Newsday, I mean, we take that really seriously because you know you can get in trouble for just lifting a video or a photo off some, even Facebook, um, some people will do it. We do not do it unless we have written consent from the person and they have to affirm that not only is it their photo, but that they took it and they give us the right to use it. So for example, in that Hawk video, that iPhone video of the Hawk that that woman had said attacked her, she gave it to me. I had to then text her the consent language and she had to write back like in the affirmative, you know, yes, I agree to this. Um, but that's like a really important issue. And actually Absolutely. the press club just did a really cool panel on, um, I'm sorry, it's over here. The press club just did a really cool panel on, you guys should check it out. It's, I think it's up on our website on photo usage. And we had some really spectacular lawyers talk about like what you can use and what you can and what you could get like in serious trouble for. Well, our classes in our mass comm department definitely stress that. Yeah. You know, getting permission or getting the, the study from the source. And in one of our classes, when we, when we produce the newscast for the week, uh, our professor always reminds us to make sure to get the right permission. So yeah. it, it is stressed in our classes, in our, in our department. Yeah, that's a, you know, so I have the language saved in my phone, and anytime mm -hmm. someone gives me a picture or something, 
I send them, the, I text them the consent, and then I take a screenshot of the, you know, because obviously I'm not carrying a piece of paper around with me having them sign it. You know, that's, so, and then I text it to my boss, the screenshot where, and then they file it, so we have it on record. So I think it's a good time to maybe uh, uh, play another recent piece yeah, that sure. you've done. Uh, you want to play the Ukraine uh, yeah, family? Sure. So uh, we will go to that in just a moment. In Ukraine, I had well, all my life uh, football club. In Ukraine, I had well, all my life uh, football club, uh, guitar lessons, uh, and I left all my life in Ukraine. 13-year-old Andrei, 11-year-old Emilia, and their mom, Yulia Yermakova, had a harrowing journey from Ukraine via Poland to the United States. It was like a human stampede at the train station. All they had, backpacks and each other. Svetlana Semenova and Yermakova are childhood friends. Semenova and her husband opened their Huntington home to the family. She translated for us. The bomb hit right next to the train station while they were sitting on the train, so it was very scary. She said, I can't even put into words what I was feeling, but lots of fear. All as Yermakova's husband, who had to stay behind, stood on the platform. The three family members arrived April 8th. The community here has showered them with generosity, from clothing to a guitar for Andrei, and to this mat for Emilia, a competitive rhythmic gymnast who hopes to make the Olympics one day. She said that gymnastics to her means a lot of hard work and a lot of hard work so that in the future she can be a star. But how to follow that dream an ocean away from home? Well, that's where Empire Rhythmic Gymnastics comes in here in Roslyn. They gave Amelia a scholarship to train here and at their facility in Flushing. It's challenging for us to get her to those trainings. So we're trying to find either some carpooling options or, uh, you know, we have to buy a car. But where there's a will, there's a way. Amelia trains 30 hours a week. Andre will soon be playing soccer with the South Huntington Dragons. And they both attend virtual school at 2 a.m. because of the time difference. I'm so happy that uh, I, uh, that I uh, traveled to USA. All people uh, are friendly. Uh, the, all people are very kind. They feel safe and very welcome. Cecilia Dowd for Newsday TV. So that was fascinating. Tell us more about how that story came together. I don't know if you guys were able to hear the whole thing because I know there's a little back and forth, but it's actually super cool because this young girl was a star rhythmic gymnast in Ukraine, and now she came here, and this uh, gymnastics place in Rosin is like giving her a scholarship, and she's practicing there five days a week. Thir she practices 30 hours a week, it's insane. And you know how I found this story? Social media, which I wanna point out, it is, I get so many of my stories from social media. I am in so many Facebook groups, Instagram, Twitter, I mean, even TikTok, although, I'm not so great with TikTok, I'm getting there. But I mean, I, this woman um, put up a post in a Facebook group and she said, you know, I'm, I'm housing my friend from Ukraine with her two children. She goes, I could use some help. Um, the girl, young girl is really into gymnastics. She's basically looking for help because the only two rhythmic gymnastics place, places she could find were in Roslyn and Flushing. And this woman who's housing the family has her own four-year-old, so it's really difficult. So all these people are coming and helping out. But I found it off social media, which was so cool. The difficulty with this story, and I just did a similar one the other day, is the translation part. You have to figure out, I'm supposed to keep my stories under two minutes. That was a little long. But you have to play, like, if I'm speaking right in Russian, you're speaking Russian, and you're translating, for the video, you first want to hear me speak a little bit in Russian but then you go immediately to the translator. So it kind of extends the, the sound bite, we would call it, right? So that was like, it was tricky. And it was tricky for the editor, and it was tricky for me to write it. Um, I think it came out really well, and it was awesome that the, um, the young boy spoke really good English. It was pretty impressive. 
but you know, there's always challenges every day. And then I'm afraid of, oh, I hope we pick the, the right part of the bite where she's speaking Russian, because I don't understand Russian, so I hope we pick the right part where she was referencing what we then went over to in the translation, you know? So. Absolutely. And right now we're going to open it up to some audience Q&A. So do any students have any questions? Sure. That was my hardest thing. I actually, oh, I, I just have, I can't even watch my beginning stuff when I was at Fios. Uh, it just takes a lot of practice. Um, do you think I sound different there than I do here? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I actually did, back when I was at News 12 Long Island, I, I didn't work till 2.30 in the afternoon. I actually found a voice coach in Manhattan. I was lucky because I was still living at home and I could, because it's crazy expensive. It was like $125. An hour. Wow, wow. Yeah, but I do think that helped. But I don't think you have to do that. I think it's just really practice, practice, practice. Like if you ever wanted, I could send you one of my stories and you could just practice. Um, what I used to always do, and every like consultant has always like uh, critiqued me on this, is I used to say, hi, I'm Cecilia Dowd. Like, and I would end everything with a question. And I really had to start paying attention to like, whoa, 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 that sounds so bad. I mean, I'm still working on it. I mean, I think most reporters will tell you, but it's just a lot of practice, and like I think a lot of people do that, is they'll end a sentence with a question. You can't do that. You have to just really be cognizant of you know, ending down, right? Um, and I just listen to a lot of other really good reporters and how they speak. The other thing is like choosing which words to enunciate. I remember when I first started, I think someone had won the lottery, and it was $30 million, and I think I said, and he won $30 million, and my photographer pulled me aside, and he goes, you're focusing on the wrong word. It's $30 million. So just like little things like that. And there's great books out there that'll help you, but just watch a lot and, and, and listen. Um, sorry, listen and read about it. I, I have great things my voice coach used to give me. They're like, used to give me, they're like VO scripts for commercials. So I might have like, I don't know, a Geico, I, you know, I don't know. And I used to practice reading these really short things and that really helps. Yeah, it's hard. It is hard. Yep. So um, what would you say as a journalist was, I guess, the most impactful story you ever covered, the one that was most meaningful to you as a human being? And then my second question would be, how challenging was it in those moments where it really impacted you beyond a journalistic perspective to, to stay objective in those moments? Oh, so I mean, I could give you my answer right away. So for years I covered um, this FDNY firefighter, his name was Ray Pfeiffer, and he almost became like a friend, right? And you're supposed to separate yourself from that, but it's very hard when you're covering somebody for so long. And he basically was dying of 9-11 related cancer for years. So I followed his story for years. Um, and you know, there have been stories where I've cried. It's, it's hard not to, I mean, I covered the Thomas Valva story. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. The little boy who basically was found, I forget what temperature his body was, in frozen in the garage, in the garage. In the garage horrible. Right. I mean, yeah. sometimes you just have to be a person, right? If you shed a tear, no one's yeah. gonna say, you're not a good journalist. But um, the, the story with Ray Pfeiffer was, I covered it for Fios One for years, and one of the most impactful was, so he had a bucket list. And a couple months before he died, I think against his doctor's wishes, because he was basically in hospice care, he wanted to go down to the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington and place a wreath, and he did it. I mean, it gives me the chills to think about it. He was frail, in a wheelchair. His wife like wheels, you know, went up with him, and together they placed this wreath, and he died within like two or three months of that. I mean, it was just incredible how he's always, and he became the face of, um, he became the face of those who responded on 9-11 and became sick years later of 9-11 illness. And it's not, a, it's not a title he wanted becoming the face of 9-11 illness, but he just figured if I don't speak out, who will? I mean, he made trips to DC and spoke to Congress and he, I mean, and he was so, I mean, I would be with him and I could tell he was, out of one to 10, his pain was like an 11. And he would still talk to me. And I had to cover, I actually had to cover his funeral. So that was, and I still talk to his family. So it is hard to separate yourself, but at the same time with something like that, 
It's not like he's a politician or he's someone mired in scandal and I'm like friends with it. This was more of a story where, you know, there was absolutely nothing negative about him and I did a lot of feature pieces on him. Um, but it's not like I would go and hang out with him at the bar or anything like that. But yeah, I would get emotional. Like you cover somebody like that for so long. How do you not? I mean, you're Absolutely. only human. Absolutely. I mean, there are, of course, there are certain lines you don't cross, but um, there are other times, you know, you also have to build your, it's like such a fine line because you have to build your sources and you, you build relationships with people, but you do have to be like so very careful not to, right? Like let's say someone's running for Congress and they want to go out for a drink. Well, I mean, Newsday reporters, like the typical print reporter, like obviously you have to meet with people, get to know them, have sources, but like you can't let them like pay for you. Do you know what I mean? Like there's rules. Um, so, you know, so for example, if I've been out, like in, even at Fios, if I went out like to, with a source to talk about stories, I always say that we're splitting the bill. Like I'm not, you know, just, just to always be careful because you, Absolutely. people are always looking to attack, so. Mm -hmm. These days, it's, it could be tough, you know, so you just always want to be careful. Absolutely. Um, any other questions from students? Yeah. Oh, oh there's a mic. We have a microphone. Hi, my name is Jacob Beal. I'm a mass Hi. communications and broadcasting major. You just talked about your most impactful story. What would you say is the most challenging story you've worked on? What obstacles did you have to overcome to help tell that story? Oh, that's a good one. Well, I mean, I. I'm gonna have to think of a specific example, but I think sometimes the most challenging are, like, when I'm assigned a story at 9.30, I'm supposed to have my script in by 3.30, and it's a topic that I'm completely unfamiliar with, like something with the quality of water, with all these chemicals I've never heard of, and I have to do, like, a quick study. Like, those are always hard. Um, but there have been a ton of stories where nobody wants to talk, right? So, for example, um, I, I can't, sorry, I can't think of a specific one right now, but. Like, let's say we go to court, right? And the prosecutors allege all these heinous things against the defendant. And then, let's say the defendant's out on bail or the defendant's family's there and they're all walking out of court after and none of them will respond, even the lawyer. And then as reporters, we'll go up to the lawyer and we'll say, listen, our story is gonna be completely one-sided if you won't talk to us or the family won't talk to us. Usually that will work and a lawyer will at least give you a response so you have the other side. But when that happens and nobody talks, then it's like, okay, what do we do? We don't have a lot of time. Maybe we go to the defendant's neighborhood and try to find people who know the defendant. Just, I mean, that is the hardest thing is you're under deadline and you only have one side of the story. I mean, um, let's say something happened, bad happened at a school. Usually, most of the school districts on Long Island have public relations uh, department or they use a public relations firm. So at least you'll get a statement, usually. But I'll always say, well, do you think the superintendent could do an interview? Because just like using a three-line statement isn't really evening out the piece. So usually you can kind of talk to people and explain it, but sometimes it doesn't work. And what I've had to do in certain stories is say, you know, we reached out to the lawyer for the defendant multiple times. They have not returned, uh, you know, emails, calls, texts, things like that. But I would say that's always the biggest challenge is having that story that's not balanced. And the other challenge is getting man on, the, well, it's kind of a sexist term, but it's called man on the street, MOS. And, um, you know, my boss likes that. He likes to get Long Islanders reactions. And there are times where you'll try for two hours and nobody wants to talk to you. Mm. So that's another uh, tough thing. And typically I'll be able to get someone, sometimes I'll just change my location. I found that the Long Beach Boardwalk, people are very friendly. Oh, okay. I have like my certain spots. <laughs> Eisenhower Park in East Meadow is great. Um, it's, it's funny, we have like our, you know, our list of like, okay, we'll go there if, if, if all else fails. So. And, uh, Professor, Air, Professor Hare actually told us, I forget where, but it was either, it was either a Whole Foods or a Stop and Shop where like, yeah. she would go a parking lot where they were like, very friendly. So yeah. I've heard stories of like, reporters like, having their spots where like, the friendly yeah, people we have, our, we have our spots. Well, you know, when you're at the beach, people are in a good mood and right, they're down, right. enjoying the sun. Hopefully it's the sunny. And like, mm. so we've had luck there. And we also try to always get a diverse group of Long Islanders. You know, we don't just want men in the story or we don't just want women or we, you know, it's good to get, I mean, Long Island is such a mix of people, right? You have a Haitian community in Elmont, you have a Hispanic community in Brentwood. So we're very cognizant of trying to get a mixed group of people. Like we do, we want just, you know, cause you get a lot of retirees if you go to a park during the day, but do you mm -hmm. just want like, you know, men who are over 70 or do you really want to like get a young mom and do you want to get, you know, so it's, we also really try to get, you know, a fair mix of people that represents Long Island, so. Absolutely. 
Uh, next question. Hi, my name is Sebastian. Um, my first question is to you is, what is the uh, word of advice you would give to college students that are graduating and coming into this field in the business? I mean, my main, the advice I always give, but I don't know if it's too late, is always when you're in school, try to get internships, because that's super, like that's how I started. I mean, I interned at News 12, and they, that worked out for me. Now, I'm not sure if you can intern if you're, once you've graduated, because you guys would know better, but do a lot of places still want you to be in college while you're there? Yeah. Some, some don't, but some do. It, it depends. Like, when I started, when I applied, I've seen companies that will take a paid intern even if you're out of college for a certain period of time. Okay, most of the, I mean, most of the internships that I'm aware of are, at least when I was mm -hmm. your age, were not paid in journalism, maybe some are. Yeah. The other thing I would say is network, like reach out to local journalists. Um, that's why I love the press club and being part of SPJ. Like I, I now have like all the, now being on the board of the press club, I have all these new friends. Um, and you know, some of them have really been uh, mentors to me, but I would network, I would also, oh you, okay. I would also just read your local papers, watch your stations and, and just network, go to events as much as you can. We actually have events, I could talk to you on the side because we have to wrap, but um, try to get to know your local journalists and you know, I've had people help me out and we have to, you know, we have to share the wealth there, so. Absolutely. Well, uh, we want to thank you very much for joining us here today and taking, out, taking the time out to do so. Cool. Thanks. It was awesome. Absolutely. I could talk for another two hours. <laughs> well, a bunch of us could hang around maybe and talk okay. journalism and media still. And we want to thank you very much for joining us for this Five Towns College production. I'm Sean Lanigan. Have a great day.